everyone, and welcome to Overwatch Lately. I'm Chris Bupasaurus Lassard here with one of the most wrinkled brains in Overwatch. We've got your Ash J. Long on Twitter. Can you take a second to introduce yourself and tell me a little bit about your background and why I asked you on today? Yeah, sure. So I'm, yeah, uh, like you said, Chu, the head coach, Team Envy. Um, been in the Overwatch scene for like uh, as long as I can remember. Um, climbing, just crawling, or back when Gosu Ladder was the most important thing. Uh, I was back there doing that with a bunch of different teams. And uh, ever since then, I managed to settle down, you know, in varying different positions, going from analyst to assistant coach, even did doubled in managing for like a year or so, which went terribly. <laughs> um, and yeah, from you know the most, I guess the most memorable ro team I was on before this was Envision, and now from Envision to Team Envy. Been chilling. Yeah, so I don't know. Funny story before we start, I always like doing that, uh, a little colloquialism. So I, when I was doing Contender Season Zero, I was doing like the boop of the week and the shoulder content uh, way back then. Um, Envision was there. Were you coaching Envision at that time? Yes. Okay, so you were with the, with Jaru. Uh, and and mm -hmm. so for literally a season and a half, I thought your logo was an eye. Or like a, like a penguin, sorry. The logo is an eye. I thought it was a penguin for... Yeah years and i was talking to monty and i was like don't you see a penguin and they were like no it's obviously an eye i was like no it's a penguin so is it a penguin Chew? is it a penguin? yep i yeah. remember i remember you mentioning it and once once you said it i was like it is a penguin. he's absolutely right it's a penguin yes. <laughs> exactly exactly so, it's been a penguin <laughs> All right, now back to the serious stuff so the big thing that everyone's talking about right now is the fact that overwatch league week one has happened. It was a pretty big week for Overwatch in general. Everything kind of coming into one place so we can finally watch Overwatch League. It was on YouTube this time around, and that was very interesting. There were some challenges, I think, in the overall broadcast that'll probably be smoothed out. Um, everyone is going to be eating cheese at grooves for a very long time, uh, I am I'm pretty sure. But overall, after week one, you're connected to the Dallas Fuel on Team Envy. How do you think things went? Did you, did you watch the games? Were you excited? Were there any highlights for you? We were actually at the homestand in Dallas, so I got to see all the games live, which was like super fun. Um, the homestand was like really, really great. Um, I think esports in general live can be pretty hit or miss. I've been like to a lot of different events, and you know sometimes they like really hit the mark, and sometimes they kind of miss it a little bit. But uh, I think Overwatch in general and the Dallas homestand was super fun. Um, but yeah, Overwatch League looks good. Uh, the new teams all look good. Yeah. I think uh, it's gone in like a, I think slowly but surely it's going in like a better, more competitive, more like, you know, driven direction. Yeah, there was a map where I think there were how many different heroes played. We got that variability that we wanted from that last patch going into hero bands next week. But um, were there any type of meta things that surprised you or personally something that you kind of want to shout out uh, to the rest of the fans using your kind of coach's brain in terms of, all right, you know, these guys might've lost, but look at this player or, or something along those lines. Um, I mean, it was nice to see Valiant Trust do well. Uh, I think one of the biggest takes he, um, like analysts, um, casters, everyone had about the roster was like, you know, the DPS and support lineup obviously looked really, really good. And it was just a matter of how they were going to approach their front line and how their front line was going to, you know, take the brunt of the meta. And mm -hmm. um, particularly like being familiar with Gravy and Gig, we kind of could expect what they could do as a tank lineup, like what soft style they were going to enjoy, what soft style they were going to play. And I think we like kind of, um, got to see that in, like in all of its glory, pretty much. Like Gig's already like developed himself as like a great uh, bunch of highlight reels. You know, <laughs> he's already got Chad status. And China, Mag yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. McGravy's also, um, you know, he had a lot of great moments, and I think that was like the big question mark. And I mean, day one, they kind of answered it like, "This is how this is Elliot Valiant, right?" And I think that was like really enjoyable to see from them that uh, their end. Um. I think Dallas Fuel as well. I think they did a really good job. They had uh, tough opponents, and they, 
you know, I think they held their own in like the whole series. Is I think some people are going to have question marks, obviously, but in my opinion, that mixed roster and how they utilized their new players. Uh, you know, Trill was subbing in and out, and I thought Trill looked great in the maps he was playing. They just got Crimson. I thought um, Crimson did a really good job. I think uh, the Fantasy League tweeted out like he got he was like in the top five for Fantasy League points. But uh, you know, what I mean, like I think they both of those rookies had a really good. Set series and on top of that like it kind of proved that their pickups were uh good pickups in Doha and DK like they both did incredibly well over the series so like things are looking good for you know these new teams and these teams that kind of for lack of a better word like you could have had like uh you know, meme teams in in the league. I think like we've gone away from that direction. I don't think there are going to be meme teams this time around. I think it looks very competitive, and I feel like every team in the league's taking like results very seriously. That's uh, that that's really awesome to hear. I know the Valiant came in. People were either like they're gonna they're overachieving or just gonna completely do terribly, right? And I think yeah. uh, I think the Valiant came in and they overachieved. You know, and it's so cool that you're saying these names like McGravy and Trill, all former Envy, uh, you know, obviously, <laughs> uh, players. Uh, but McGravy always known for bringing fights back with those bombs, or just in general. I remember there was a a game on Dorado where McGravy uh, a couple years ago where McGravy brought a whole fight back on Dorado and then the team, then NBC nine. Um, I, I, I think it was against gladiators on Dorado a couple seasons ago, but he's completely able to do this every single time. And I think these players coming in from contenders, they actually have a lot of tape on them. Gig, Throughout, ever since he was on Shaken Contendies, was known as a as an aggressive Reinhardt, if you say. Uh, and he's always charging, and it's really cool to see how coaches and people have been able to utilize these things that people kind of memed on a little while ago, and have actually been able to hopefully take and actually make it an advantage for their team. Is that something that you think about with your rosters and moving forward? Hey, can we? How can we take this flaw that some people are making up and actually utilize it to our advantage? Yeah, I mean, using. Dallas and Valiant as two examples. Like, obviously, Dallas had the We're Not Broke meme. And, you know, they, they have a very, che like, cheap roster, which everyone can admit. They basically went with, like, a lot of contenders players and a lot of free agents. But, like, it's obvious that they've fought by it. They've taken it seriously. That team already has defined themselves as, you know, some of the best scouted talent, um, some of the best amateurs. And they have a play style that's probably going to carry them, like, a lot of Ws. And... Mm -hmm. Like, they're going to be a team that's very exciting. Uh, the same for Dallas Fuel with, like, um, you know, they were, their roster was always, like, a big question mark. People were constantly asking, like, why is this person starting? Why is this person starting? Why haven't they picked up a new player? Why hasn't this player been benched? Yada, yada, yada. And, I mean, they answered all those questions. They, they got, like, some incredible, like, we got a name like Gamsu, but on top of that, like, Doha DK. We're seeing Trill utilized correctly. Um <laughs> I, <laughs> but in general, like even in my opinion, that the that team's done a really good job addressing, like you said, their weaknesses and their downfalls, and hopefully, like we see that trend just continue, and mm -hmm. um, every team in the league goes from strength to strength. Um, your question was, how have we done it? Yeah, have you been able to take any of your players as kind of maybe on another team might have been a flaw, but on your mm -hmm. team might actually be something that helps you guys win? Um. I mean, I'm sure Daru won't mind sharing this, I guess, if I can use him as an example. Um, I think some people were a little bit... Uh, I I think, like, in terms of, like, player identity and stuff, this idea of, like, hit scan and flex or projectile and stuff is kind of still... Like old fashioned, and mm. Jaro is one of the first players that I kind of took a look at. And rather than saying like, okay, he's a projectile player, he has to be like Genji, Farah, Tanzo, this, that, and the other. Like you kind of look at them as a person, and you think like, what can they actually do? What can they actually bring? And for Jaro, like, he wasn't the best at managing a huge hero pool. Um, you know, sometimes we'd put him on a hero, and he looked uncomfortable, and we'd be like, oh shit, you have to go and grind that hero out for a little bit. He'd go back and he'd grind it for a week, and then it would pay off, but, like, you know, maybe some of his other heroes would take a hit. So being able to, like, for us, um, to utilize Jaru and his, his actual strengths, in my opinion, one, in the guts matter, he was the best bringing contenders, like, by far. Um, on top of that, uh, Sombra meta, he was easily the best Sombra I've ever worked with, and I thought he did an incredible job. On top of that, he was a really great in-game leader, he was a really great like shot caller, um, he was very, very, very vocal. Um, so even the 
uh, sometimes he had some shortcomings and some matters, like some heroes. If it was to be pop, if it was gonna like you know become a dominant hero, you'd have to go out, go away and grind it really hard. But um, at the same time, metas that had staple characters that he could utilize and use as like a catalyst for his communication, Brig and Sombra were the big main ones. Um, he was able to just absolutely take over the game and having exploring that with him and saying like you know you can't beat yourself up because you can't um you know shot call on fairer and develop like that mechanical skill set on her um you don't have to like pay yourself apart and think like you're a bad player because there's clearly like things you do incredibly well and it's just about like looking towards those so as individuals yeah you can check that stuff uh you can um figure that stuff out with um your players uh jaru was probably like the biggest um like turnover i've seen mm-hmm. in terms of like player development um but yeah i think every every player you work with you kind of assess you know okay this is what he can do like how do we push that and it's really important it's going to be even more important with the hero mans and stuff but making sure you're aware of what your player can't do and not pushing it too much i think um we notoriously had a problem of trying to replicate our strategy in like basically to a T and for for better or for worse uh, I think like it had negative impacts on some of our players because we would just ignore what they were good at and instead say like mm. you know look at what Striker's doing on Reaper do it you know at the end like there's, Forehead, no, yeah. there's no argument there's no argument just do all of this and I think like that can screw with a team dynamic and a player's mentality as well um if they think something's good or they want to do a certain thing and you say it's bad because striker said striker doesn't do it and it's a really it's a really like you know a terrible way to go in terms of coaching and i i learned that lesson last year <laughs> i think one of the hardest parts <laughs> um, i i don't know i've 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 like coached but like seven-year-olds playing soccer not like you know (laughs) boys becoming men playing overwatch right Mm. and so it must be hard balancing kind of like making sure that their individual personalities get to grow and mature but at the same time they're part of the team how do you kind of approach that in terms of team dynamic because your job as the coach of envy is not just to do well in contenders and honestly i think you can make an argument that your job is to help them grow and make it into overwatch league right i think at this point you've placed an entire team uh plus a couple into overwatch league at this point so you obviously know what you're doing and when you're scouting when you see players uh like jaru what are kind of like the the three things that you look for to say you know what this guy is or girl is gonna fit in our team right that you know number one he's got a good head on his shoulders number two he's mechanically gifted right what's your kind of pyramid of success when it comes to putting a team together um you kind of mentioned the first one which is a big one for me which is their um the player's ability to understand like the team and the team atmosphere and environment i think most players need to hit a healthy balance of today like today's for me this hour's for me uh this block's for me this Mm. map's for me like if you have things you're working on if you, you know you're learning may and there's a lot of stuff like May walls, you need to pay attention to the enemy front line. Um, then yeah, sometimes you need to like really center yourself on that. And you spend the next two hours the next day uh also um you know paying close attention to yourself, which is good. But I always think like the most successful players are aware of their team and aware of like what's actually happening and going on. Mm-hmm. In other words, they're not selfish. Um I think it's very evident when a player is selfish and they are obsessed with their own personal value their own gain how they look on how they look on screen you know how they look in game like uh, how they, like how often do they appear in the kill feed like it's very very evident when someone's mind is there mm. and i think um from my experience anyway uh those players do um like they hit like a ceiling where their only strength is what they like their only strength is like themselves and they're very like unsuccessful at you know um being a part of a team and like paying attention to their teammates what do their teammates want to do what makes their teammates successful and like communicating that like their communication skills uh, are usually in sync with you know them just being stuck in their own head um so they're not very like approachable and they don't approach others and i've, I've just seen that enough times to know that's like a terrible 
thing for Overwatch, and it's a terrible thing for Overwatch players to have. It's a red uh, flag. Yeah, absolutely. It's a big red flag. And yeah, I think since then, paying attention to people that also pay attention to others is... Uh, I love has been, that. Yeah. That's, uh, I, I love the way that you said that. And so like, kind of to follow up on this, I know this has completely off of the script so far but i think this is super cool um in terms of kind of like what you're thinking so you mentioned that as a red flag so something that was on twitter uh, yesterday was lemon uh posted a tweet that was like do you think passion can be taught right because actually something that i i, I say all the time when it comes to people coming into a new field is you know skills can be taught passion cannot Right. In your opinion, I think this is something that you should have a, like a huge opinion about. Right. Do you mm -hmm. kind of side with the side? Oh, there's a lesson in everything. Right. Anything can be taught if you're a good coach or you got to come in with the skills, man. If you like or you got to come in with the passion, I can teach you the skills. Right. But you got to be willing to do, you know, as much as you can. Right. Where kind of do you fall in the ideology? Um, it is an interesting discussion. I. I would argue most people are on a timeline or on a time frame are working within a certain uh, parameter. And I, I would love to just say, um, take the side of, yeah, you can teach, you know, you can teach someone to be a teammate, you can teach someone to be passionate, you can teach someone to, um, you know, be empathetic and care and the whole team atmosphere and stuff, be that sort of person um, over time. But, I mean, you have to assess how much time it, it's going to take and how worth it actually is. Um, they better be the best crack shot you've ever seen if that's like where your concern is. If you're like, okay, we're going to need to spend a long time making this person like not a dick, I guess. <laughs> um, like they better be insanely good at the game for that to be worth it. Um, like uh, the, I guess the phrase you'd use is like catering to someone, um, someone who yeah. clearly has a significant downside, whether it's professionally or personally. I call um, it the brilliant asshole situation, right? Yeah. Like you're brilliant, but you're an asshole. So I don't know how I want to do this. I think um, if you have all the time in the world and you're not a, an org, a team, a coach that's stressed about like, um, you know, how long it will take, then yeah. yeah, you can take a chance on someone like that. But um, from anyone, from my personal position, if I'm looking at like player turnover and I'm thinking like, um, you know, should, am I aiming to promote this player this year or next year? Um, then I have to really think about like, how like are they going to be ready by the time a signing window opens and if my signing window is in six months and i i mean we've mm. done it i mean lulzish was like record breaking i think he played like four officials with us or something <laughs> we we like promoted lulzish in like a month but yeah. um it, it, realistically if i if i was looking at some of my roster and i was expecting to promote them in six months could i take a risk on someone that's got a terrible attitude no i couldn't like, um, but if, for example, you were making a two-year investment and you knew you knew what the end game was with that person, which two years is such a long time in esports. I don't. Yeah, I don't it is. There's not many esports that can even like accommodate like a two-year time period. But if you were, <laughs> if you had that sort of idea, and you were like, say some 16 year old who's the best aim you've ever seen, like complete raw mechanical talent, but knows nothing about a team atmosphere, knows nothing about professionalism, then I think a coach could tackle it. Yeah, you, you should look at that person and say like, hey, he needs help, the investment's worth it. You know, when he's 18, 19, he will understand a lot more and I've given him as many, I've given him like the environment he needed. I think that's like a completely fine approach, but for something like Overwatch Contenders, we do not have like the time or resources to like even think about something like that. It's just the band so from isn't there. Yep. So from our perspective, it's the opposite direction. Like they have to come with that, um, you know, that mentality, that empathy, that that professionalism, pretty much immediately. Well, that makes that makes complete sense, and I love that you're even thinking: is this a two-year plan or a one-year plan? Because I know a lot of people surrounded by myself, including myself, that can only think ten minutes ahead. So it's really good that you're thinking about how am I going to develop these people past this one-year uh, period, right? Because then the whole thing, like in education, I was an education major. We were we were talking about that earlier, and it's all about the journey, right? You got to get from A to C. C is the goal. C is Overwatch League, and B can look 
very different for every single person, Mm -hmm. right? And it's your job as a coach that that journey has a chance to complete, right? Not necessarily that you're going to be there. And I think that, I think the, the term here, like it has a chance to compete. You have to bring yourself over that last hump with your passion, you know, with that drive. Would you say that's Mm -hmm. accurate? Yeah. I love being the, in the B. Like, I guess, like, <laughs> I'm the B coach, right? I'm yeah. Not, um, I really, like, kind of embraced that idea that, like, I'm part of this player's professional journey. And I think um, potentially some, a lot of tattoo staff, the mistakes they might make is, like, they try to embrace a culture of like winning contenders is the dream that's like first place in contenders is like your life is complete this is all you should think about this is all you should care about and i've really gone down the approach of like i i know like my place in the ecosystem i know like what contenders is what i'm supposed to be doing what my players are supposed to be achieving and i've kind of like embraced that in terms of you know relationships um what i tried to do and achieve and build um which i think other people hopefully are doing the same thing i know there's a few other contenders teams that have done the same thing um i'm like really big fans of them. people like second wind i think their staff know that like what their team is you know what their place mm-hmm. in like the ecosystem they've done an incredibly good job over the last two years um but yeah i think recognizing what you know being a player's B in their journey is, is yeah. like, uh, is important. It's important to know that. Yeah. Cause sometimes, you know, I, I, I... So after college, I did some preschool teaching, and it's funny because like when you're teaching colors to a kid, right? You don't think about the fact that I had a kid who swore that red was blue, right? Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know what? I guess uh, your journey is going to go behind a real quick and then we're gonna Mm -hmm. loop all the way around and get to see eventually again like sometimes you got to take a couple steps back to really take a couple leaps forward and to identify where you are in that process i think is one of the coach's biggest jobs but we got to keep going we're going to get more into coaching a little bit later i don't know if you guys can tell but i am personally very invested into learning a little bit more about this but something that was announced yesterday was the official patch going into the retail version of overwatch and so uh you're seeing it here too. How does this patch feel to you? We got some brig changes. We got some sim changes. Is this going to change anything uh, meta wise? Are you excited for this patch? Is this a little meh? Um, it's a little meh. <laughs> um, obviously we scrimmed today. We've scrimmed on it. Um, of course. Uh, without like giving too much away, I still think, um, Regia still has her place in how people are using her right now. Um, Symmetra is interesting. Um, the right click, we could see like she's been used for a primary fire, which is, you know, um, whenever we do see Sim being used, I think she had a higher play rate than Reaper, right? Statistically Mm -hmm. on that weekend. (laughs) So, I mean, like you can't argue that she's not being played, but uh, I mean, she's being used for her turrets and mouse one and a teleporter. So like, if you wanted to actually make that kind of, I mean, it, she's been played, you know, you could tell, you could technically say she is competitive and viable, but um, we'll see. I don't think, like, changing a right click will drastically affect much. Um, but, yeah, uh, the, uh, are we going to discuss the patch before that as well, like the hands of changes and stuff? Yeah, 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 because we didn't get a chance to do it last week, so uh-huh. uh, we're right. going to get to do it here. So if you take your breadth of knowledge in terms of what this patch is bringing to the table, right, where where do you see kind of the game going? And number one, let's just go ahead and say it. Thank you, Overwatch devs, for making these PTR patches much quicker. Uh, we all appreciate that. Uh, but now, Chu, uh, tell us about how this is all going to affect possibly stage three of overwatch league or contenders uh, season one well i mean we might be on different sides of the spectrum i'm i'm a massive fan of no changes i wish we didn't even have a roll lock i'm <laughs> i'm reminiscing on, on, on the goat stairs with my rose tinted glasses i love, right? I love um, goats man yeah i just think like in terms of how we approached uh just scrimmages practice like developing players like our team envy like approach practice in general we were very thorough we things had to make sense had to be 
clear cut. Uh, um, we would work with our players and, you know, tailspins uh, of the same mindset. Like, you get to a point where you understand the game enough that things become black and white. Mm. And that's the most confident your team can be. Is that like wh when you when you grind something or figure something out to a point where it's like this is absolutely always correct and this is absolutely always incorrect, um, you become like a hive mind. And that hive, I, some teams can develop a hive mind maybe off of like less information or just pure trust. But from our perspective, it was a lot like a lot of logic the five head but not not real five it wasn't it's not like we have a bunch of analysts like telling us a, a million different statistics that we can go and pull from and say like statistically like this is the best thing to do this is the best thing to do but it's just like how the staff felt and how the players felt accumulating that um using that as much as possible and coming to conclusions like over time that we have to you know execute xyz and in my opinion that's why we got to such like a confident point in the goats matter. Mm. Um, so from my perspective, I'm terrified of all these changes. The <laughs> patch has been super quick. Not only that, but like the 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 hero bands are gonna make things so volatile in terms of like what is good or what makes sense because like something could go under the radar significantly and then randomly out of nowhere, like you know maybe Anna's like a top pick for a really long time and she's the reason something can't get played, like, for example, Doomfist, mm -hmm. and then you can't play Doomfist because, you know, you've got these supports that are, like, able to survive incredibly well. And then uh, not only is Doomfist getting buffs, but then Anna's also, like, potentially getting nerfed in these pa quick patches. And then we have a week where Anna's banned. And then for no reason whatsoever, something like Doomfist could be the most insanely overpowered broken hero for a week. And every team just has to play some sort of Doomfist strategy. I'm terrified of that, that like <laughs> space, that competitive and professional space, where just like uh, whatever teams are running is purely based off of like what the devs decided to do that week without mm. like without considering every interaction. Um, so I okay. So just to counterpoint, just a little bit. I'm playing devil's sure. advocate. I'm not. Of course. I'm not doing. Yeah, exactly. I'm not doing any opinion making here. But so I guess a little bit. Uh, so I love collegiate sports, right? I love amateur sports for the sole reason that it is volatile, right? That this team from. Uh, you know, nowhere in the middle of America can beat a team like Ohio State, right? Just randomly in a, in a football week uh, is really exhilarating to me. And these hero bands kind of speak to that part of, you know what? I like contenders because I like how messy it can be sometimes, right? You get to see passion and grit. It's the pageantry of like collegiate football is kind of what I see in, in contenders. And I really, really like that. And I think hero bands really speak to that person. Right. But in terms of the players and the coaches, do you feel like you're accommodating people like me who like that as opposed to playing the highest caliber Overwatch every week? So I'm I'm not trying to like I, I'm definitely not going to make excuses and say it's going to make the league RNG. It's, I still think the best players and the best team will win. I don't think that's like anything people should be scared of. Um, fair enough. We're putting. Um, you know, we're putting more uh, emphasis in different aspects of Overwatch, um, but like how flexible your players are, how, how fast they are able to adapt. Um, you know, these things will come into play more so than ever. And, you know, the, the best roster will rise to the top. I'm not going to be the type of person who says like, it's so RNG, you know, we you're just going to roll the dice and any team's going to win the Overwatch League. I definitely mm. disagree with that. But um, from our, from my perspective, the reason why I'm nervous and potentially like you know kind of not happy with these changes is because it goes from something that I've worked hard at, which is um, you know again like logic and taking a patch and pushing like pushing not only individuals but the strategy to its limit, the theory to its limit, um, making sure everything makes like a lot of sense and coming to like in my opinion the perfect play on that available patch and now it's not about perfect play it's about um you know it's about instinct it's about the players on an individual level it's about their understanding of the game as a as like in a more broader sense so that they're able to get smaller advantages and i do think 
like this doesn't take anything away from coaches or analysts either. They're going to have another very important job. They just have to switch gears. They have to go in a different direction in terms of how they approach their individual players and how they approach strategy as a team and how they approach practice. Because, you know, beforehand, you know, there there were no variables and that was we were very confident. Our only variables were maps. Mm. And from there, you could have you could deep dive into map strategy because, you know, we knew we were going to be playing these Arisa Sigma here, 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 here. And it's about like how those transition, what makes sense, how deep you can go into the map itself. But now it's going to be, you know, it's about heroes. It's about your individuals. It's about like, you can put more emphasis on communication. Like if, if your DPS have to swap from, um, May Reaper one week and now they're playing Trace of Sombra for a week like how good is their communication like was your Reaper really quiet like and now he's playing Sombra you're gonna have a quiet Sombra and a quiet Reaper Interesting. like so I think th I'm not saying it's RNG this like I said the best players will rise to the top the best staff will dominate the season still but everyone's skill sets are gonna have to completely adjust in terms of what we thought was the best way to play Overwatch yeah, and, you know, it's so funny, hearing you talk, it's very obvious that you're kind of that, like, the thinker type, right? Because Goats was for that person, right? In my opinion, Goats is kind of, like, the purest form of Overwatch because of the cooldown management. You know, as a caster, I loved it because everything was on the screen at the same time, too. And that was really nice in terms of a, a viewer. But, like, the biggest argument against Goats for me was, like, I love mac and cheese, but I can't eat mac and cheese every day, right? So we needed some change, and I feel like this goes almost the opposite side right who here likes to go into like the money tornado and just grab things and see what they get right sometimes you get five bucks sometimes mm -hmm. you get 150 bucks right and week by week it might be different but do you uh, but now we let's talk about the players and the coaches a little bit more because of this patch uh my question is so if these were the types of things that were in place overwatch league season one do you think some of the players that maybe have moved on to Apex or some other roles might have had a little bit more success in its current state? Um, yeah, sure. I think the biggest issue with Overwatch League Season 1 was that it was uh, uh, controversial or not controversial. I don't think it was the players' faults that there were so many disasters that occurred. I think it was mainly to do with everyone else potentially behind the scenes um, making disasters happen. But um, yeah, like players' careers could be completely different. Um, there was, um, uh, if I could think of an example, like Menda, probably, mm -hmm. I know Menda is now currently playing Apex, but he was like, he was notoriously a great mechanical player. He had an interesting hero pool. I think he was like one of those Genji Tracer soldier players who yep. like kind of dabbled in like the weirdest DPS that <laughs> never really got their great, like a big shot on, yeah. on the Alma. Um, and yeah, we're going to see, we're going to see all that stuff occur. Like I, you can't really predict what bands will make a hero strong, but like soldiers so versatile and so like, um, like a staple safe pick. He's got shield, he's a hit scan, he deals enough shield break damage, he's got like burst, um, he's got self-sustain, he moves pretty quick. Like people, like despite what's happening in terms of hero bands, people are going to invest into a character like that now because we can't control the variables anymore. Like that goes mm -hmm. out of the window, right? And because Soldier is such a versatile character, uh, you have no idea if he's going to be good or not. And, you know, people might just invest into him. People might be like playing him. We'll see what baby bear's playing uh, <laughs> over time. But like, I do, I do agree. Like the, a lot of players who potentially didn't get their shot are now going to potentially see their shot. Um, Zaya players, those were the ones that like dipped off the side, like the side of the earth, didn't they very quickly? Um, yeah. We, you know, you never know like how strong Zaya is going to be. If, uh, if Diva gets banned one week and we still have Ryan, like, are we going to be playing like a lot of Ryan Zaya? Yeah. Um, are you having what... your players yeah. prepare? Are you having your players prepare everyone? Or are you going to be sticking to like, hey, chances are that two out of three of these heroes will be available, right? So we don't need to kind of like mind game this and try to be good at everybody. It's very early days. Um, I think the two approaches you can go down is, you know, uh, blocking out like this composition like uh, when when we see you know fat tanks and like a, a death ball comp we usually call it like you know the guts composition yeah uh, even though ghost doesn't exist anymore but like if you 
you make sure your team gets practice on this ghost composition. You also make sure your team's practicing dive. You also make sure your team's practicing snipers. And you just kind of constantly rotate that because no matter what, you're going to be able to play one of them. I see that approach making sense, but I also see the approach of playing the most flexible comp you can. And no matter what gets banned, having having a way of like integrating another hero into that composition and just keeping one style and just the most versatile style you can, um, the one that like can combat anything and just like training that as hard as you can. And then just, you know, swapping out maybe one week Tracer's band. So now your Tracer's plays is playing Sombra. But, uh, you know, if you play Monkey Diva, Monkey gets banned, now you play Monkey Ball. Um, mm. If you're playing some sort of like dive comp that's really flexible and you can run a lot of heroes with it, I could see teams taking that approach because that seems pretty safe. Like you, yeah. you're covering a lot of bases there. But I also see teams approaching the dynamic of we need to know every single strategy. We need to be able to you know, flick a switch at any given time and completely switch comps, completely switch direction. Um, yeah, it's going to be hard for players. It's going to be hard yeah. for staff. Plus but... travel, plus being away from family. You know what I mean? Like, it's already a lot, right? You add the fact that you're going to have to know even more when it comes to the game, right? That's got to feel pressurized. For sure. Um, I don't know. We'll probably see the toll it has on Overwatch League players and Overwatch League teams throughout the, the year. Um, obviously, I kind of think about it from like my perspective and my contenders team. Luckily, we do have the ability to have whatever schedule we want. Mm. But um, yeah, absolutely. Teams are going to have to kind of double down, double down which direction they go in. And I'm pretty interested to see it. I, I could again see a team like Chengdu trying to be as flexible as possible, as versatile as they can. But yeah. then the rule is if it has a 10% pick rate, it gets put in the ban pool, right? If it has above a 10% play time, it gets put in the ban pool. I was thinking about this because if teams are just playing a lot of Ryan, teams are playing a lot of Arissa, teams are playing a lot of Diva, and then we have Poral Chengdu that play ball, <laughs> and they play like a ball comp. I just thought about how sad it would be if, like, they are the only team playing like a certain oh. composition, and <laughs> totally. they themselves. You're totally right. Get, yeah. Get like ball into the 10% bracket, and then that week ball's banned, even though they're the only team that play it. Oh. That would be so sad, right? So you're just banning <laughs> Chengdu at that point, right? Yeah. It's just like, sorry, guys. Oh, that's so true. Hopefully, hopefully Captain Planet's got the statistics to, to help that out, but that is definitely something they need to think about. I appreciate that. I appreciate that you uh, brought that up. But we, I really want to get into some contender stuff. So um, overall, patch. It seems like you you kind of want things to maintain consistency, right? Because with GOATs, you got to really see who the best GOATs teams were, right? And then by the end of that last GOAT season, D.Va was already coming out. It was kind of a Sombra meta. Uh, you guys went through some changes with Wolfsish and Elevo getting picked up in the middle of the season. Numlocked uh, comes in, and it's been really cool to see, all right, if this patch was different, would that have happened? And to have you kind of talk about how patches affect careers and coaches, it's been so cool so far. So how do you think this patch, if you were to say one player in contenders, whether it be on your team or someone else's, that this particular meta is really going to be good for, right? Because I think the question is, who's the best player? Is it going to be a guy like Carpe, who's good at snipers, right? He's the best, you know, one of the best Widowmakers in the world, right? Or is it going to be a guy who's like top 10, in like four or five different heroes rather than like one and two on two and then like bottom 20 on the others. Who would you rather have on your team? Um, I think I would rather have, again, this is kind of from my perspective. I've never dealt with a uh, support staff big enough to accommodate specialists. Um, so I've, I've never had the opportunity to like work with a, an exceptional, you know, two trick um, or an exceptional sniper player. Uh, um, unfortunately, contenders asks us to be flexible, and uh, we don't have like the staff or resources to you know to help a player be a specialist. But um, regardless, I think I'd still look for the flexible player. You'd want someone who kind of again, like I mentioned earlier, breaks yeah. the definitions of hit scan and projectile. Having that flexible mentality, you know, if you look at someone like Sinatra, who is playing Tracer, is playing McCree, is playing Doomfist, is going, is playing May. Yeah. Um, the type of person who just has that mentality to not really care what he's playing, he's just going to go in head first and give it his all and come out on top. Um, you can kind of throw anything at players like that and they embrace it. I think those are the ones that are going to shine the most.
Yeah, who's who's someone in contenders right now uh, that you you want to say is one of those kinds of players? Well, other than Ernie and Kevster, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, that we um, we had a similar approach ourselves. This is something that I'm very you know f- fond of, and like I said, despite my personal gripes with the changes, we kind of um covered our own bases in this regard i think flexible players are incredibly important and it's what we were looking for from the start um in our tryouts in particular when we did our huge open tryout process um we intentionally did things like putting hit scans on doomfist and putting projectiles on widow um asking them to do those sort of things just to see how they responded to it see how confident they were see what their mentality was and you know in particular Oni and Kev said, so to speak, passed that test. We asked Oni to play Doom, and he just was like, hell yeah. And he just rolled out on Doom, and we were like, man, this Hiscan <laughs> player is like, really excited to play Doom. It was the same for Kev Like The amount of projectile players that were terrified to play with her, they were like, we'd be like, okay, because we wanted to play like... We got to pick all of our own comps. Obviously, we did everything in house. It was not. It was no scrims. So we would say we'd tell them like to run tracer with a dive, and we're gonna put our flex player on Widow. We're gonna put our hit scan on tracer. And the, so many projectiles were like, "Please give me tracer. I don't want to play Widow. Please don't make me play Widow." Um, and I think that attitude and that mentality is really hard to. Um, vet, like coach, you have to get players out of that habit. Overwatch isn't. We don't have a 180-man roster. You, you know, if you're a DPS player, fair enough, there's a lot. How many do we have? Like 20? Maybe a bit less than 20? Like 18? <laughs> 18. <laughs> there is a lot for sure. But, like, I do think Overwatch players in general need to have the approach of, one, playing comp all the time and making sure they're aware of how to play, how all these heroes function. And for us, like, it's just a telling sign when a player, like, loves the game, they play it all the time. You know, they're they make sure they queue up in like different roles to play all the heroes. You know, main tanks that are fluent in all the off tanks. We saw that with Gator, right? When he yeah. got brought up, when we got brought up in playoffs, like he was playing Sigma and stuff. This is a main tank that's just been playing Arisa Ryan for like the past year, but his Overwatch League team in playoffs put him on Sigma, and, and he killed. He was amazing. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, like, you can't like. Uh, I don't think you you can't value enough like the players that have that approach to the game. Mm. And the the players that don't, I think, are too old school. Uh, it's it's two, 2017, in my opinion. <laughs> it's so old school, man. <laughs> that was last decade, uh, Coach Chu. All right, man. Well, thank you. Hey, just so everyone knows, if you saw it on Twitter, Neptuno does approve of hero bands. So if that is what you needed to be okay with this, then you've got it, my friends. Um, so we've talked about the patch. We've talked about hero bands. We've talked about a lot of what's currently going on, and something that's been flying a little bit under the radar for the last couple of years in Overwatch is the path to pro. And so, uh, Ash, you've been walking the path to pro for a while with the Envy boys. You guys killed it in the seeding tournament, right? You only lost one map the whole time, two second wind. I don't know how that team keeps doing it, but whatever. I don't know what they're feeding those kids. But for <laughs> some reason, second wind continuously with a new roster in what feels like every two weeks is still competing with the best of the best in it contenders. But in your opinion, going through this uh, seeding, you guys only lost one map. You did win the seeding tournament. So you guys are all Gucci. You're ready to go. Number one seed for the tournament uh, coming up. Just what was the general experience for you, right? This is totally different for the season. Did you want to play more games? Do you feel like you got a good visual on the rest of the teams? Just how, what are your general feelings about the season, the, the seeding tournament going into the playoffs for contenders? Um, I liked it. It was more enjoyable. It felt more, um, it definitely felt more competitive. Um, in the regular contender season, um, unfortunately, like, you know, I, I don't want to, like, come across as overly arrogant here, but if we had a contender season and, you know, like, so... (laughs) So if we're, like, like 5-0, right? Um, We're 5-0. We've already qualified for playoffs. We're just kind of, like, trying to secure first seed, which is what happened, like, last year. Um, And our six games, uh, someone in the bottom of the standings... We can take. We've already scouted them a bunch. We know everything that they can play. Like we can just go and look all that up. Um, we can abuse them in whatever way we want. We can be confident. We can cheese them. There's a thousand different things that we can be absolutely sure will work. Yeah. And 
I think that kind of blows. I really prefer this format where, you know, th- we had to take every game seriously because every game, in theory, we're playing the best mm-hmm. opponent we could at the time. It, I, our, our bracket never got easier. That shouldn't ever happen, really, in a season. Like, I feel like if you're climbing and you're progressing, you should always be playing against the next best thing. People who are doing um, for- the same. Yeah. yeah, and so a, a ta- like a play like a playoff bracket, every game we have to take seriously. It's not like okay, we win week one and week two are the hard ones, and then we can chill out for two weeks like that. That's so lame as like an like a practice environment and as a season when like your hardest games are at the start. Um, so for this to be like a taste of what you know contenders is going to always be like, um, it was really good because we couldn't we couldn't take a day off, we couldn't relax, we couldn't like say we've got next week in the bag. We had to take every game day by day, week by week, and even like from going from the upper bracket final to the grand finals. Um, Playing against Second Wind, we went 3-1. They took a map of us, and then they make it to the grand finals again. It's not like we were like, oh, we know Second Wind play. Like, we don't have to think about it that much. Worst case scenario, it's another 3-1. We're like, they might have gone back into the chamber, and now they're doing something different, and now we have to be ready for it. We have to make sure we're preparing. We prepared even harder than we did last time, even though it's the same opponent. So, in my opinion, this format's a lot better um, just for, like, the professionalism of the players, too. Totally agree. <clears throat> yep, I totally agree. And I think the thing that people really underestimate about this versus what we saw last season, I think the contenders' viewership did struggle. And again, just like you, I don't want to, like, shit on other teams. But when you tune in and there's two one and four teams playing against each other, right, and you have to sit in that game for two and a half hours, right? Mm-hmm. It's not like there's, like, another channel showing football or soccer, right, where you can just watch another game. Right. This is the only game that you can watch and it's not that great. Right. So why am I going to continue investing into this team that I'm never going to like anyway? You kind of touch broached on that at the beginning of of, Mm. of this talk. Right. And I think what this is going to do is going to give everybody an opportunity to create a storyline and moving them into potentially higher roles. Whether you're a coach for a team that upsets a, uh, you know, a contenders proper team like Montreal Rebellion kicks them out. Now you're all of a sudden in the seating tournament, your stock has doubled in size mm-hmm. right and so yeah. it is just so much better and i think it's gonna be a lot easier for teams and players to move along the path to pro and actually have it be a path rather than all right let's shake this boggle thing up or or you know or like you know when you're doing the lottery right you come up and you're like all right mm-hmm. this person because of who you know or because you happen to be good this week right you get to you get to move on and i think this season it should be really good for that because honestly between, especially last season, you and Atlanta were just very, very good. Third Impact was pretty good, right? But everyone else was kind of on the looking up, right? And that, I don't think, was the best viewing experience. And I, I'm kind of hearing you agree with that uh, as well. Yeah, it comes from a lot of sides. I mean, even from your perspective, right? If if you are looking at the schedule and you see, okay, so now you're going to cast contenders, right? Cast contenders is on broadcast. And you get to cast like three Atlanta games. You've got Sky Foxes who maybe they won contenders last week, right? And Sky Foxes are back in. So you get to create like a bunch of storylines yourself on broadcast, yep. which makes it way more interesting for the viewers rather than... I don't know, scraping the bottom of the barrel to come up with something for like maybe like the worst game of the season. Like it's a, it's nothing against the players that are doing it because tier no, two, no, like no. you said, it's all different um, levels of experience uh, and you know st- infrastructure and stuff. So like those uh, those teams that qualified for contenders that went on five, there's uh, maybe that's where they were right like this time around. Like that's it. The, the, it could have been an achievement just to qualify for contenders for them. And it's not their fault that that happens, of course, but, um, you know, you, you they get a guaranteed six weeks of play time and they're not on five. Their game doesn't matter. And it's not their fault, but, like, what are you supposed to do on broadcast if that's the case, too, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, totally. And, you know, it's so funny. There was, um, I forget, there was a game, not last season, but two seasons ago, where it was, like, both 0-5 teams and it went to map five. And I, I just remember, and, and, like, it wasn't because... I'm not going to say the team names because what I'm about to say is kind of mean. Um, but it was like it wasn't because the game was good. It was like when two five-year-olds play like or two five-year-old teams play soccer. It's competitive because they're five. 
you know? Yeah, just, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. And, and that was kind of like the feeling. And it's like, okay, we got to really push this. And then as a cast, you start feeling like, oh, you know, I'm not, I'm being disingenuous at this mm-hmm. point in time, you know? And, and then that kind of gets in your head. So you're, you're totally right. It's a challenge, I think all around, but you mentioned some players, right? You've, you've graduated a ton of players, uh, shocking that Crimson Fire, in my opinion, took this long, <laughs> uh, to get yeah. up there. Um, uh, Ellie Vote, one like one of the most, I don't know, flexible players we've ever seen in contenders. Uh, Jaru, one of the best Sombras we saw. I I remember him playing uh, Brig and just is so aggressive, but he was the only one that knew how to turn it back. Right, that I felt like it was like he could turn that volume meter up and down, and so you know what it takes to get into Owl. You know these players really well. So on the current iteration of Envy, we also had a question in chat about how the roster is working. How are you kind of deciding in this iteration? Because well, there are a lot of new people outside of Taimu, right, <laughs> who who's been a part of the field for a while. So how are mm-hmm. you utilizing Taimu as a leader and everyone else on this kind of newer roster while also finding the same kind of success? How are you doing that? That's nuts. Um. Like I said, it's yeah. It, it takes uh, it takes a lot of th- different things. Um, I mean, it's not just me. Uh, this year in particular, I'm more confident than ever, just because uh, of the staff that I have bringing Bomb on full time, um, and having Tail. Like I, I feel incredibly good about the people I have around me this year. Um, I think we're gonna do even better than last year. I could swear by that, honestly. Um, but yeah, in terms of, you know, I guess the consistency of how we do it is, again, like looking at the players uh, that we have or the personalities that we want to bring in, the people the people that are successful, like I said, are the people that can uh, kind of leave their ego at the door. Um, particularly, like, if you think about Crimson on Fire, um, who are the most incredibly gifted players I've worked with? I've worked with Fire for an incredibly long time. And I... To the con- the tweet, the the tweet discussion you had uh, that uh, Ham was part yep. of about yeah. how, like the Captain. investment of a player, yeah. yeah. Um, I do. I thought Fire was already in 2017. Like him and Boink were the best Lucios in Contenders Season Zero. Um, fair enough. Like uh, Envision and FNR GFE didn't win versus um, Team Envy and Phase Clan, but in my opinion, Boink and Fire were like the two best main supports I think like that year potentially uh, if you consider that like um the best teams in the west uh fire and boink were the best lucios in the west like that i would stand by that in 2017 they were absolutely killing it and fire didn't go out then and that blew my mind um and then ever since then um i always felt like fire was kind of playing towards his peak and then he proved me wrong the next year he just like constantly was developed him in de- developing himself, taking himself incredibly seriously, taking his career incredibly seriously. Um, I basically lent on him as an extra staff member in 2019. He developed so much of our strategy. He did so much of our in-game. Um, and it's really unfortunate because people don't get to see that stuff. Not only do you not get to see that stuff like happening in our team, but like the tryout process is so difficult to get right that yeah. for a player like fire in my opinion whose value is like almost immeasurable he can't show that in a tryout like what mm-hmm. what 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 can he like what can he do to tell like these players like please let me igl please let me shot call like please listen to my like setups i want to like call some stuff i want to tell you how to play this map and honestly like he could do that uh, but there's a lot of negative connotations to that when it happens as well. If it happens in your trout, you have someone come in and they really want to take over. Like, they're like, I'm going to call the strats. I'm going to call everything. Just let me dominate comms. Like, get a guy out of here. We want to hear the other five people <laughs> on the team. Um, so it's unfortunately like tryouts are stacked against players like Fire. And I'm so happy that he made it because we, the, uh, we wouldn't have had any of the seasons we had without him. <laughs> so uh, Ham and I, our favorite thing that Fire does is he will just straight up duel a widow because he wants to. I, I know it's like <laughs> I know it's because of a strategy, but I'll, I'll I'll forever remember just like our observer one time was on a widowmaker and wanted to go over to Fire, but he couldn't he couldn't find Fire because he was just running loops around this widowmaker on the high ground on Ilios ruins that he was just straight up dueling him was dueling Sombras. I remember one time uh, he booped a Sombra away and then the missed EMP because of it. Like those are the types of moves that I think like only a few people can make and that's instinct right to be able to just inherently know when to pull those things 
off. So I'm so happy that Fire and Crimson made it because they've been a dynamic duo for so long and they get to keep going that way. But unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. uh, that's uh, that's all the time we have for that section. We have a, a little small section. It's going to be 30 seconds long uh, because Chu, you have an answer for this and it's one word, I'm sure. What are some passions you have outside of Overwatch? Uh, <laughs> none. All that right. I gave you okay, right. that was the answer. All right, it's all about life balance. You know what I mean. But uh, I, I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that we get to talk about that because you know you're you're in here, right? Just like with casting, I want to be completely enveloped into that world. And sometimes other interests need to take a break until you're 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 making that money on your current one, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> uh, pretty much. Yeah. All right. Well, going uh, over, so this is going to be a little bit more about you. We've got five, ten minutes of just let's learn a little bit about you and how you kind of got in here. We've talked a lot about Overwatch, and I think in a lot of this content, we we talk about Overwatch and only Overwatch, and that's about it. So why don't you, and Carter, I swear to God your question's coming. I've been saying it for like 45 minutes, and it's going to be here, I swear. So uh, what is your kind of like origin? Tell us about what kind of birthed the gamer of Ash J. Long. Um, I mean, it was pretty random. I was at like university. I was I always loved games. I was actually doing a degree in game art. Um, I wanted to be a like a a digital concept artist for gaming or anything, just in general. Um, it was something that I didn't really know I wanted to pursue until like it happened. Um, in high school and stuff, I was very like academic my best subjects were math my best uh, well I, I was it actually came from like i was always jealous because my sister was an artist she was like naturally really good and i was terrible i hate like i was so bad at drawing like my picture sucked <laughs> compared to my sisters so like i in that sense like i just chased that route as hard as i could and i was just always a fan of art and wanted to like push that aspect of myself and because i found again this is gonna sound so five head i'm I am an idiot, I promise. But like in high school, I was I found math super easy. I found science super easy. So like I didn't really care about them. And then mm. I found art so hard, so I pushed out. I like that's the one that I wanted to get good at, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I at university I was still playing like games and stuff, but I wanted to pursue gamer. And um, you know, one of my college friends got me into League of Legends, which from then like again it's it was like a game. Yeah, it definitely is. Uh, um, you know, he I was playing it and then he was like, Oh, you should check out like the world the world stage. This was like the season two grand finals. I think it's the one that did TPA win that one. Yes. Yeah, TPA won that. That was right. the one where CLG EU had to play that like yeah. fifty minute game that got cancelled. Could you imagine? Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah. That's so he like showed me this and I was like, What is going on? Are these like professionals? Like he showed me like because it was outside arena, right? I kinda remember that shot from D Man. D Man was stalling <laughs> for like the longest time because they were uh, uh it was like like he said, it was like a fifty minute or like a two hour stall or something on broadcast. <laughs> yeah. So I remember like the arena and it was huge and I was like, This is a thing? Like what? <laughs> this what on real. earth? Yeah. And then so like from then on I, I started like paying a little bit more attention to esports. He showed me CSGO and stuff. I unfortunately I never like was big on the FBS, but like the fact that like these esports were a thing and it was like that was like the moment it kind of exploded in the West, in my opinion, because I was always aware of like Call of Duty game battles when I was in high school. Like, you know, my friend, my friends were playing online for like, and one time, like, one dude won 50 quid, and it's like, oh, crazy. You won for like 50 pounds playing Call of Duty. But it never clicked that, like, that's a thing. Um, <laughs> until I saw that, and I was like, oh, wait, this is like a real thing. This is crazy. And I eventually didn't finish my degree because I was obsessed with League of Legends. Yeah. Um, and I ended up not finishing my uh, second year of university and just like hard committing. I I want I thought about going pro for like a really long time. Um, but I, my friends always told me like I was always thinking about the game more than I was playing it and stuff. Like I understood the game better than I could play it. I managed to like get to uh, I'm the same I think, way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to like Diamond One playing support, like <laughs> playing the game sixteen hours a day, every single day. Like I had no time for anything else. I just played League of Legends all the time and I managed to get to Diamond 1, but I never like broke that master challenger scene or anything. But um, I ended up like, when I took a step back, I thought about analysis. I started working with some teams, like coaching them, started working with individuals, seeing if I understood how to coach or anything like that. And um, there was an analyst competition uh, that was 
moderated by I don't know if you know who Jarge is. He was at one point was a coach on TSM. He's a British dude. Uh, okay, I think yeah. The name that, sounds familiar, but I, it's not coming in my head right now. Yeah, like J A R G. Okay. Um, yeah, and he was one of the moderators for it. And I have, I like won the whole thing. I got first place, and it was like I think it was like two hundred dollars. Um, but you know, like it kind of it popped yeah, up. Yeah, it popped up a little bit on Reddit, and I was like, I, I could do this. Like this is a thing I could maybe do. Like I didn't know if I was good or not. Um, it had like four rounds where they ask you, they gave you a lot of assignments, uh, random things, um, and I passed each one, and then I came first place. But on top of that, it got me in touch with some of the Challenger Series European teams. Um, but I knew pretty early on that I didn't want to stay in Europe because this was like 2000 and um, maybe like 2015, 2016. It's like a decade in esports years, man. Yeah. Yeah. uh, Europe was pretty underdeveloped in terms of its professionalism. There was a lot of like European scandals, especially in League of Legends and CSGO. Uh, Team, like the organizations weren't what they are now. We didn't have our G2s. Um, Even even Fnatic was under a lot of like flack at the time. Um, They just... They just weren't where they were now, but I knew NA was like trying really hard. Like they were putting way more money into it. They were like doing all these big things. We we had, you know, TSM who were doing the game crib stuff at the time. And we saw like, wow, they're putting them in houses and stuff. It's all crazy. So I knew from the very beginning that I wanted to work with an American organization. Yeah. Um, so I was working with Challenger European teams very briefly. They were all very mean to me. They stole my work and didn't pay me any money. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, Overwatch came out just a little bit later. And I, it felt like so hard at the time because I'd won this competition. I I'd been, I'd, was into League for a long time, but it, the climbing the ranks or figuring out how to you know get into the LEC, LCS at the time, that looked really scary to me. And then when Overwatch came out... Um, it looked like something that I could jump on early on. Yeah. So from then on, I like immediately approached teams to coach. I was playing the game like a lot, but I knew very, very quickly that I was going to be an analyst. I was going to be a coach. I wasn't going to play the game as a pro. Um, and I ended up getting in touch with the first team I worked with was a team called Bald Purpose Gaming, who were like rank 40, 45 on the Gosu ladder. You kind of laugh, but the, the first player I ever worked with was Verbo. Oh, uh, Verbo, right. Verbo was the team captain of that team at the time. Yeah, this, you're talking about when like Rise Nation had a team, and like yeah. all, like way back well, then. That's crazy. Not, not only did they have a team, but they were one of the best teams. Yeah, the they were. Rise I was worried. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, man, boomers, man, boomers. Um, cool, man. So, uh, so y- you start talking to teams. You work with your initial team. What brings you to Envy? Uh, so that was all. It, I mean. I want to say it was all like complete luck. It's a lot of connections and who you know is what yeah. got me places. But at the same time, um, I guess if I wanted to make myself feel a little bit better, it was due to like <laughs> how much like my the people that worked with me trusted me. So like all purpose fell through. The team disbanded, but I had everyone wanted me to come with them to the new teams. I. Team Harambe, oh, I can't remember what they were called, like Harambe Comets or something. Verbo joined that team, like that was another team Verbo made <laughs> before, just before yeah. he joined Immortals. Um, I can't remember what they were, it was something about Harambe. Anyway, so they wanted me to come follow them and um, coach their team. And then some of the other players, uh, Lord and Taeon, I think, ended up joining Hammers Esports and they wanted me to join them. And unfortunately, Hammers Esports was an actual organization. And so I chose them over um, the Harambe Comets, unfortunately. And uh, that's when I met Packing Ten, who was the head coach of that team uh, at the time. And um, I stuck with them for as long as I could. Um, and then that team ended up like, they didn't disband. They, they turned into LG Evil, right? Uh, yeah, so what happened was Mike left for Method, I think, so he got paid more money. Packing 10, sorry. Packing 10 ended up going to Method for like an actual position because Hammers, again, was like a super underdeveloped organization. It was all like kind of weird cash in hand kind of stuff. There was no contracts involved. It was just like, win some stuff, we might give you some money, which is what a lot of teams do uh, back then anyway. <laughs> um, so Mike ended up joining Method, which was obviously the right way to go. And I stayed with Hammers. Um, they eventually kicked the whole roster to pick up Bird Noises, which then became... Oh, you got Bird Noises um, created uh, Quatank in NA. I remember they were the first ones that I really saw uh, play. Wasn't a Vast on that team? 
He was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Moira I, had just came out. People were running Roadhog, Quad Tank on everything. Uh, oh, that was a, that was a rough time. So yeah, I ended up staying on Hammers as like their in-house analyst. They picked up bird noises, um, and then that's when yeah, it was everyone. It was Jake, Avast, um, Train, Vol. Oh, uh, train, the Jake train. I forgot about the Jake train. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, super. Um, so it was all those guys. I worked with them for like two weeks and then they got me fired. I don't think they liked They didn't like me. <laughs> it was like the only time I've ever been fired from anything. But those guys, <laughs> uh, those guys were like, we don't need a coach, by the way. Um, I remember they made me do a scouting report and I gave it to them and I was like, uh, it was a scouting report on LG Loyal, so it was like Super Pluke and Hard Blue or something like that. I think it was like, <laughs> yeah. And um, I was telling them like, this is how Hard Blue plays Roadhog. This is how you can abuse him. Like, look at this stuff that he does. This is how this is how um, Seagull abused him on Hanza. Like, uh, I had all these little clips of stuff, which I think is like pretty useful. But they said this is all stupid. <laughs> and, then they, and then they told Hammers, and Hammers kicked me. So, you know, Avast was the reason I lost my first job. That's fine. It's not a big deal. We're friends now. <laughs> but um, That's so funny. When that happened, I mean, they didn't stay on Hammers for very long, right? They ended no. up, like, Hammers. They, they ended up joining LG Evil. And, and then, then they didn't qualify. Uh, because yeah, LG Evil still had, like, a really disappointing season that next season. Yeah, uh, and then Hammers became Hollywood Hammers, and they picked up that Christopher roster with, yep. I, I can't remember who else was on the team. Um, so yeah, from then, I didn't really know what I was doing. I just had to reach out to people. I reached out to Mike, and Mike was friends with uh, a manager who just started up a team. He got an offer from an org called Envision, and he's like, it was, I can't remember what the team was before they were Envision. The McGravy, Coffee, um, they had a name and I can't remember it. But anyway, this roster got approached by, you know, the owner of Envision and was like, hey, I'm going to fly you guys all out to this land in Montreal if you guys win it. Uh, if you guys win DreamHack Montreal, then, you know, I'll pick you up as like a uh, full roster because he wanted to, uh, Envision wanted to be like the Montreal organization. He wanted to be like, you know, that's their home. Like MV is Dallas. He wanted Envision to be Montreal. Um <clears throat> Anyway, so they ended up doing that. They won DreamHack, and then they got signed, and they said, we want more staff. And then so through that, and through me knowing Mike, Mike recommended that they pick up me. So then mm. I got approached by Envision. And again, this was back with McGravy, Coffee, Fazix, um, Darksma. Uh, I think I'm missing someone. Was, was, was Nuki still a part of that team? No. Because she was on the team with McGreevy beforehand. I think it was called Cat 5. Cat 5? Yeah, 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 yep. yeah. I think yep. that's what it was. Uh, that's, so um, when I joined, I Shiny was on the year. original Envision, right? Um, No, Coffee. Coffee was the original Coffee. Envision. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, when I first joined them, they were looking for a Lucia. Um, and we we'll look for a different Lucio for quite a while. And then we ended up approaching Fire. Uh, Fire was a flex apart at the time. He played with Bishu and Bishu's team. I can't remember what that team was called. Um, damn, I can't remember what that team was even. But yeah. <laughs> um, he, he was a flex apart at the time. And I had worked with him on Hammers before that. And I was like, I love Fire. Fire's really good at the game. We can ask him if he wants to try out main support because they were looking for a team because that team imploded. Uh, that was, I can't remember what Bishu went on to do after, but we would trial Bishu out as well. And that's when we got, we picked up Fire and Sini. And that's what became the Envision roster that went to the uh, Overwatch contenders and got shot on by FaZe. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> but... Um, yeah, we. That's kind of how that happened. I stayed with Envision for as long as I could. Um, that whole thing imploded. Uh, some <laughs> nonsense right. happened. Some nonsense pretty happened publicly. <laughs> pretty publicly, it imploded pretty publicly. Um, so we ended up getting our contenders spot. This was between season one and season two of 2018. So we had yeah. control of our contenders spot. Um, it was given to us, not the organization, and. We just approached Envy. We messaged Aero and we were like, do Dallas Fuel want an academy team? Maybe. Like, <laughs> we marketed ourselves as like, you know, we were making playoffs every time. Yeah. Unfortunately, we weren't winning everything, but we were coming like top four consistently. So we were like, you know, it's a playoffs team. Um, we just want 
some money in to keep playing. We don't want to do anything weird. We just want to keep playing contenders. Um, and Envy was just all about it. It was the luckiest thing I've ever experienced in my life. Um, the whole process from like our contracts being completely null and void, so no legal action had to take place. They just our contracts vanished. We had no contracts. Blizzard gave us our contender spot, and we were like, "Can we just give it to Envy?" And Blizzard were like, "One in us." They were like, "I don't know if you should do that because Envy can do what they want with that spot. Like if we." If we give it to Envy, Envy could pick up like six new players. Like our, our positions are guaranteed, obviously. But because we trusted Era, um, we knew Envy was a very safe org. They're very nice people. Um, we just told them, like, we just want to play. And yeah. they said, yep. They took the spot off us. They signed us all. And we just carried on. Well, that's awesome. <laughs> and, the, and the first season with Envy wasn't amazing, right? I think you guys barely made playoffs because yeah. Glads did something at the end of the season that dropped them down. Uh, and I, 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 that was like my first, that was my first season uh, as a caster. I remember looking at McGravy and I was like, this kid is good, right? Like, I really like this McGravy kid. And I remember other people were like, I don't know, man. And so when he finally made it into Owl, that was like my first like middle finger to a lot of people. It's <laughs> yeah. like, I am smart. I got it. Um, anyway, um, well, that's a really interesting story because it seems like a, a lot of times in esports, um, it really is just opportunity meets preparation, right? You prepare, you prepare, you work, you work, and then when that opportunity presents itself, you got to be ready, right? Because you might get fired, you might get let go, you might not be in contenders one season, but the future can hold whatever, and you kept your knuckles to the ground, you kept grinding, and now you're here uh, as the favorite of uh, of contenders moving into the first uh, tournament. Yeah, fortunately, I haven't had to like push push any limits in terms of like my connections but that is really kind of what happens like build bridges to burn them like be friends with people uh and if your work's good enough like you can never complain you can never like blame and say like your work wasn't good enough um if people know you're good like it shines through like exactly. people re people remember um <laughs> so yeah unfortunately well I've, more fortunately i've had a stable um you know a stable job for a long time but if that ever comes a time again where i'm lft uh, hopefully like you know i've made enough friends and people have, yeah um that love it. you know people know what i'm capable of hopefully <laughs> all right carter are you ready here it is so now that you're head coaching envy we, we've talked about how you got here so now you're talking to the players right so uh what carter did a little earlier was he uh it, it, this uh, the reason why i really wanted to talk this is because this kind of speaks to my education background too there's a lot of like little tips and tricks that you can do with a lot of uh students with some adults in terms of helping people focus right because i don't think the people who are drawn to professional esports world are necessarily the most patient or the most work ready people in the world or you know the most attentive people in the world mm -hmm. right it doesn't sure. mean that they yeah. can't get there so what's like so carter brought up the, the metronome thing which is a very common technique to focus people in right it's like okay put this metronome on and so it kind of gets the fuzz out of the way so you can focus mm -hmm. in on what you're supposed to do what's like one thing like one tips or trick that like hey i'm trying to coach my high school team or i'm trying to teach my dad how to play uh in terms of something that i can teach them that you use in in your your world uh to kind of help them focus and improve um i don't know if i'm like researched enough on like psychological impacts of things you can do to help people focus like again i'm not from that sort of background yeah um I mean, if you're aware your players struggle to focus, we put a lot of, I personally put a lot of emphasis into like making sure my schedule kind of reflects that. Um, if we ever do a two hour review, which we do it is necessary a lot of the times, um, you know, if you're coming into five new maps or four new maps or whatever, sometimes you have to go down each one, one by one. You have to like make sure everyone knows what we're doing in every single map. Um, so those reviews take a long time and you have to bear in mind that like your players are tuning out, they're tabbing out, they're checking Twitter, they're going to be browsing Reddit, they're going to be DMing people. Um, and I think I don't have any metronome takes or anything, but <laughs> when you're when you want the intention of specific players, just make sure you involve them as much as possible. Like, don't talk at someone for two hours because at best they listen to 30 percent of that um yep. we whenever even strategy like you have to take you know we understand that like even if it, this is important um we can't guarantee all six people paying at any paying attention at any given time so if it's a strategy that involves main tank off tank main support say their names 
make sure they're listening, ask them questions, and they will be invested into it. And fair enough, like your DPS players, you know, I don't know, like is shooting bots in the training range. But if you need to bring him back in, then bring him back in. You say like, you know, if I, DPS player. And they're like, yes, sir. You're like, all right. Like you need to pay attention to this bit because this bit like involves you. And you just like, you just have to kind of play with that a little bit. I think yeah. uh, people will make the mistake of thinking like, if my players that pay attention to my voice for two hours, they're wrong. They're not wrong. You're boring. <laughs> you know? No, no. So you, man, something that you just said that people like, people don't think about these things as important, right? I think sometimes people think about things like saying your name, right? As opposed to being saying like, hey, right? Like saying your name makes it personal. And really that person is going to be way more receptive to whatever comes after because you've personalized it, right? And that seems so simple, right? But the difference between doing it and not doing it is just so small. Why not just do it? And you're only going to get good things out of it, right? And um, the fact that you said that really proves to me that you, like, you, you know what you're doing, right? You might not be researched. You might not have like the studies, but you're thinking in that way. And the mm -hmm. fact that you're even thinking about, all right, make sure to say their names is actually a way bigger deal than maybe even you might think about it. But it's uh, it's huge in terms of developing cohesion uh, within a group because when you say someone's name, it individualizes and pers you know personifies things for them. Uh, but also you get to refer to them in the group still. It's really cool. It's like small little psychological things affecting team atmosphere like that. Mm -hmm. And so um, super cool. All right, two more questions, man. I'm sorry. This is... This is our longest episode ever. We could ever. go all day. Yeah, all day. I know, man. I'm having a, I'm having a great time. And so, um, uh, something that, uh, just to kind of close out this coaching thing, um, describe to me like, what is the day in the life of, of, of your life, right? Like, you you're waking up. Are you with the boys? Are you, are you doing other stuff? Like, what is a 24 hour period in a contenders coach or a team envy's coach's life? Um, what kind of between, um, I guess, daily schedules at the moment. If you'd have asked me before, uh, when my players were working from like uh, home spaces and yeah. I was working from my own home space, you know, it would be making sure I'm up anywhere between two hours to an hour before like the day starts. I kind of make sure I just open up something, whether it's an owl game that I was thinking about in like at 2 a.m. in bed or at scrims, like I just reopen it up, like refresh myself on some of the things that was happening, make sure I'm thinking about like, oh yeah, this is what we wanted to work on because um, I think the biggest problem people can have is like, if you turn up 10 minutes before, you kind of have those euphoria moments, or, like the eureka moments, sorry, like you know, uh, six hours later, or, you know, you, you kind of have it like three hours into the day. But realistically, you want to start your day with those moments where you're like, oh, yeah, I really want to be doing this. Oh, yeah, I really want to be doing that. I remember last night, like, I needed to fix this and that. And when you have them in enough time to then uh, absorb and apply to the day, it's the most important thing. And it's hard for, I, not only for players, but for staff too. Like, yeah. if you're, for me, if I wake up 10 minutes for a scrim and I, you know, turn on my PC, open up Discord, sit inside and scrim start, I'm like, yeah, you guys know what to do. That was, <laughs> we actually had that as like a running joke in one of our previous teams was, uh, the phrase you know what to do because uh, I, I don't think it was a particularly like poor day from my end but it was just it's one of those maps that we were doing well on or whatever and I was like you guys know what to do and they were like great coaching by the way that excellent coaching <laughs> we know what to do but you really want to avoid those situations where you're not prepared and yeah. So, you know, an hour to two, just even if even if you don't have to sit down and open up a bunch of spreadsheets and start breaking stuff down but like just Check what you saw. Just re remind yourself what you saw last night. Just, yeah, just bring yourself back into it as soon as possible. And that's the same for players. Like, you know, you don't want to do that two hours early. But um, right now, obviously, we're using the Dallas space, which is really exciting. We have our headquarters. We have our contenders space there. And so cool. Eventually, before the season begins, we will have all of our players here. Um, right now, we have half. We have our Americans and Europeans will be here very, 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 very soon. Um, but yeah, like we get to go to that space. You know, we get in there early. We get to sit down. Um, we prefer to start the days of reviews, not end them. Um, if you review in the morning, uh, you get to 
basically outline everything that's going to happen that day and your players get to apply it. Like we just mentioned, attention span. Um, mm-hmm. If you talk about a bunch of stuff, if you talk about a bunch of stuff the night before and you just go like, you guys remember what we talked about yeah, last they're night, They're not going right? to remember shit, yeah. Go do it. Just go do it. Um, so from us, like reviewing in the morning, making sure you talk about all these things and involving the players as much as possible. It's about them. It's not about my big brain. Uh, like they need to understand things. They need to have an input. They need to want be doing things the way they're comfortable doing it. So that review in the morning, and then we end uh, like our first block. Sometimes we have a 30 minute break. Sometimes we don't. Um, and then you'll break for lunch, and then you'll have one or two more blocks before the day ends. Um, days can end pretty simply once the block's over. Good day. See you later, boys. Um, other times, you know, you want to sit around. You want to discuss things. You want to make sure, like, you're confirming um, that people are comfortable, happy. If mistakes are being made, like, do they understand why they're being made? Um, so that discussion is definitely a lot more casual, but it can be, like, 30 minutes to an hour long. Um, if we have to open up an image or a clip or a VOD or whatever, sometimes that'll happen as well. Um, and then it's just mainly about checking up with the players that I want to check up with things that don't necessarily need to be reviewed, but like a player needs to be like messaged, spoken to approached uh, their opinion. Like I lean on not only my staff a lot, but I lean on my players a lot too. Um, I don't really consider myself a, a, a giga brain, like coach. I'm not trying to, I don't, I'm not playing chess. I'm just uh, like doing what I'm just kind of like a catalyst. I'm facilitating as much as I can. And I love it. So, I ask my players things all the time. I ask my staff things all the time. I, you know, I gauge how people are feeling, what feels good, what feels bad. What do we, do we want to try something new? Do you want to push this? Are you comfortable pushing this? Um, and I do that just as much as I can once the day's over. Um, you know, it, I don't put too much pressure on the players. I, I, we're not the most formal team in the world. I also have the mentality that Overwatch is very dangerous if you overcomplicate it. I don't like yes. the idea that, you know, um, too much can go wrong um, if you're giving players too much at once. Yes. So for me, when I approach a player, it's usually about how things feel. It's about how what they want to do and anything that they think we could be doing more. Um, and then we just talk about that and then I, I see what makes sense and how, how we can implement it as like a unit. And... That's kind of my Ooh. day. Do you think because you're, you know, you're you're bragging about your math skills earlier? I do not have quick maths available for me. Uh, but I'm terrible um, at math now, by the way. I haven't <laughs> done it in like ten years. Well, do not test my math skills. I'm not. I'm not. So, <laughs> so, so something that math is is all about process, right? It's like, oh, you you do this, you go through this, you know, th- this equation, and you, uh, the yeah. answer will shoot out the other way. Do you think? I, for me, I hear that and I definitely see that in how you're approaching coaching, right? It's like, all right, let's get through these processes first. You can't, again, like, I'm going to use another metaphor, right? Like, a lot of people, if you think about process as a pyramid, right? A lot of people want to just start at the top, right? And if you put mm-hmm. a point on the ground, it's just going to fall over. There's nothing to keep it up on, right? So you got to build that base and then you can get to the top. And that's obviously what you're doing in terms of how you're explaining all of these things. You're giving the personal responsibility, but not too many variables, right? It's mm-hmm. so cool. You would have been an amazing teacher, uh, but this is going to be a lot more fruitful for you. We need you to stay here because Thank we need you. more of that because that's, and I have a degree in it, man. I'm not just, I'm not just blowing you up, man. I know this teaching stuff uh, pretty well, and that's just super cool. Um, and to close things out, I ask every guest this, and thank you for such a wonderful episode. Um, uh, why Overwatch? What, what is it about this game that's kept you here? Um, it was the, I feel like it at the beginning, especially, it's still true, but it, it brought so many different people together. Um, one of my favorite things when I first started coaching, whenever I like met a new player, I'd be like, "What? What did you do before Overwatch?" Like finding that stuff out, and the answers were so like crazy. From um, I'm going to call out Prima Dulce. He was a Shadowrun. He was a Shadowrun pro. Did you ever play Shadowrun? That was like <laughs> one of my favorite games ever. It was like it was like some first person shooter, but like at the start of the round, it was like oh, um, oh it was like you got to pick like, like trolls and elves, and you could yeah, decide. Yeah, yeah. It was like, magic, it was the game and you had, had of its time, in my opinion. Yeah. 
he was, was way, way too ahead, ahead of his time. time. Yep. But like, I remember like speaking to him, and I was like, "What did you do before like Overwatch? You know, people be playing playing League, TF2, uh, Minecraft, like C- CS:GO. Like, you got all these different backgrounds." And he hit me with Shadowrun, man. He was a Shadowrun pro, and I was like, <laughs> "Overwatch is so cool because it doesn't matter what you just did. Yep. Like, you're now playing Overwatch," and it kind of encompassed so many like different titles and it was it it definitely was like a like a breed of love um in my opinion you could see that like its inspirations were everywhere and it it was very original it's super it's such a super original like idea people were calling it like a people even tried to call it a MOBA at the time of its release which is kind of crazy but like because it had so many MOBA elements right people didn't know what to name it they were like what is this um but yeah, I, I love the aspect of it. Um, uh, I had such a great time playing it. I hate playing it now. I don't play it at all. But <laughs> I love watching it still. That's fine. Um, but I absolutely loved playing it when it first got released. And yeah, it was it was just like, it was also ruleless. Nah, we're going into like, why I don't like all these changes, but like, <laughs> <laughs> but like, I mean, at the time when you could play six of the same hero, you could play six of anything, and like the <laughs> bears were so crazy. My, the like, very first piece of content I ever watched in Overwatch was Hanamura six divas just bum rushing the point <laughs> on point A, and I laughed so hard when I saw that. I oh man, nostalgia, man, nostalgia I mean, coming through. Yeah, we we recently just went back and revisited the. Do you know the strap from Team M- like Team Envious's scrims? The six divas to talk to stall Hanamura second. It's the infinite stall. Do you remember that? I, like the the image that got leaked. The I, video I, that got leaked. I uh, it's so good. It yeah, okay. it's just uh, it's just like it became a thing, and that was actually probably the main reason why we inter- introduced like one hero limit. But like they're just six divas sat in spawn. One goes out and they count down. You can hear in the comms like, uh, I'm losing mech now. Okay, I'm out of mech. And, and someone else will go, okay, you next. And then they go next. And then there's three more divas in spawn. They're like, me next, me next. And then he goes, I'm out of mech now. And he goes, okay, I'm going. And then someone else will go, me next. And they're sat there and they stall for like three and a half minutes until they get like a kill with a diva bomb. And then the person that got killed with a diva bomb swaps soldier. So there's now there's five divas on point and there's one soldier that's run high ground. Dude, on top of that, there was another thing. I remember Misfits. This was like, one of my favorite things I ever saw, which was um, Nepal Sanctum. It was five Lucias and a Bastion. It was five Lucias flying around the map, like going from pillar to pillar, and the Bastion just sat in a corner, and they just like booped people infinitely, and it was just railing them down. And I, uh, I don't know. When I was seeing uh, this, stuff, I was like, "Is this this game's insane? <laughs> <laughs> How is this ever gonna work?" And I love it. Right, yeah. you get thrown into the fire. That's so funny. You know. It, it, it's crazy to think about like where we came from, right? Something that always makes me laugh is the fact that Diva used to kill herself with self destruct, right? Like things that like you don't remember from PTR, like Bastion having a shield or um, a Genji Blade lasting literally eternities, right? <laughs> back back like six K Dragon Blades and Contenders was something that we got like every week back in the day, right? Yeah. And uh, that's just so crazy. But just hearing you talk about it, I can hear that happiness and the love just shining through and uh, shine through all all episodes today. So thank you for this marathon episode. I really, really appreciate it. It's been an absolute blast. Hopefully we get to do this again one day. Good luck uh, in the Contenders uh, season upcoming. You guys have only gotten one at map loss. I'm kind of thinking that you guys might be able to go through that playoff bracket without losing a map. I don't know who to bet we'll on see, that we'll one, see. but we'll, we shall see. So, Chu, where can we find you and your work online? Um, Contenders YouTube channel. That's where you'll <laughs> see all the fruits of my labor, hopefully. Um, so tune in, support that. Uh, b- uh, Blizzard, promote it, please. Um, but yeah, you can find my shit posts on my Twitter. You can see me at Ashley Long um, is my at. Uh, other than that, I don't really have anything. Follow Team Envy. They do loads of nice content. Follow all my players. They're also funny shit posters. That's fun. Um, <laughs> But yeah, th- thanks for bringing me on. I appreciate it a lot. It's yeah, um, I I, I want to do it. I want to do it again. I feel like I have like eight million more questions I want to ask, but unfortunately, time is up for us. I've been Chris Bupasaurus. We'll start here with UGC. You can find me at Bupasaurus Rex on a Twitter. Please follow UGC Studios as well. So UGC has a Twitter page for all their tournaments and stuff, and UGC Studios is where our variety of shows are going to be found, and we're onboarding some new ones hopefully soon um, of some titles that you all know and in joy once again that's at ugc studios and for me that's at bubasaurus rex i have been chris and that 
has been what's been happening in Overwatch lately. We'll see you next week.